Thank you so much for bearing with us through a couple of technical issues. My name is Mathis Keshavars, and I am a board member with Arab and Middle Eastern Journalists Association. We welcome all of you today to this excellent event and our esteemed panelists. Before beginning, I wanted to give you all just a little bit of background on who the Arab and Middle East Journalists Association is and the work that we do. Um, we are an Arab and Middle Eastern Journalists Association and we encourage all of you who are watching and listening who may be working um, on or around issues of the uh, Middle East and or of Middle Eastern descent to consider joining Amija and you can do so by going to www.amija.org forward slash forward slash join. Um, we are excited today to include some excellent panelists for our discussion of whether or not we are living in a simulation and how science fiction can help explain politics today. I'd like to welcome our panelists first and foremost, Walida Amarisha, who is a uh, educator and a writer and is the author, co-editor, I'm sorry, of the book, um, Octavia's Brood, Science Fiction Stories from Social Justice Movements. In addition, John Spates, who is the writer, I'm sorry, screenwriter for the upcoming film, Doom. Uh, Daniel Nexon with Georgetown University's School of Foreign Service. And of course, my fellow board member, the esteemed Nahal Tusi, the foreign correspondent for Politico and the originator of the idea for this, um, for this talk today. I welcome all of you to our conversation and I look forward to hearing what everyone has to, to say. I'll turn it over to you, Nahal. Thank you so much, Matthias, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, this has been a, a very strange few years, and I have to tell you, as somebody who covers foreign policy and politics and who loves science fiction, um, so many times over the past few years, I've said something to myself like, I can't believe this is real. Is this really happening? Am I living in a simulation? Did I wake up in a parallel universe? And it seems like everything that you can think of has happened short of an alien invasion. Uh, you know, time also seems to just be compressed. So many things are happening that it's hard to keep up. There are moments that I can barely keep my memory straight. Uh, and so I thought of this uh, and I wanted to do this panel uh, because I just thought maybe given that the election is just a few days away, it might be a good time to do something that's a bit fun, a bit cathartic, but which explains to these two things. And one of the things that I was really, really happily surprised by when I tweeted out this idea a while ago was how many people in the world of politics and foreign policy do love science fiction. Uh, so this is the way it's going to go. Basically, I'm going to ask a couple of rounds of questions uh, to our panelists, uh, and then we're going to take some audience questions. If you have a question, please uh, put it in the Facebook messages, and we will uh, definitely try to ask it. Uh, and we're going to try to do this in roughly an hour and um, keep it going and cover a lot of ground. So thank you guys for being here. And the first question, uh, it's the same question for all three of you. When people talk about the sheer wackiness of the past few years, they sometimes use phrases like, this is the dumbest dystopia or the wrong timeline. In what way are these sorts of sci-fi or fantasy descriptions a helpful way of looking at what this country and to some extent the world are going through? And in what way are they not helpful? And Walida, can we start with you, please? Sure, absolutely. I'm excited to be here, be part of this conversation. Uh, so to me, I think science fiction uh, is useful in that it allows us to imagine beyond the boundaries of what we're told is possible. So I think in that way, it's useful because it allows us to root in the kind of futures we want rather than uh, you know, the reforms that we're told are realistic. Often the idea of realistic social change is a method of social control. So I think it's useful in that way, but I, I think it's fundamentally not useful to talk about the past four years as a simulation or as something separate from the rest of American history, because it takes it out of a historical and structural context. I think for anyone who is trying to understand the present and build a different future, we need to be rooting in the past. We need to know that this moment is actually built on the, the foundations of where we've come from. And especially if we are centering the voices, the experience, the leadership and visions of communities of color, we could have seen this coming. Uh, so the idea of this being a dystopia is really, it is white folks now living the dystopia that communities of color have been living for decades or centuries. So in that way, I don't think talking about this as separate is useful because it decenters the uh, the voices of the marginalized and the oppressed. 
That is absolutely fascinating. And it's, it's such, a, such a very good point. John, what, what do you think? Well, I think that's beautifully said. I think when we reach for metaphors as a population like that to say, oh, this is the darkest timeline, we're living in a simulation, we're saying that we don't recognize the mechanics at work in our society right now. This is extrinsic to the reality we think we live in. This is alien. Um, and the way in which it's unhelpful is precisely in that that is untrue. Um, these mechanisms have incubated in our civilization and in our society for many generations. And uh, precisely as Walida says, those mechanisms have been visible to the minorities and the oppressed populations for a very long time. Um, it's very analogous to what happened when Barack Obama became president. Um, and so many people started crying out that there was suddenly a rise in racism in the country as if he were an engine of that. But in fact, what we were seeing was an exposure of a mechanism that had lain dormant for a long time. And as long as white figureheads were in power on top of civilization, they were quiet. But the minute that paradigm was broken, you saw this upwelling of discontent. You saw these sort of societal dysfunctions manifesting themselves. And it felt like the introduction of something new if you didn't have your eye on that ball. But for people who had been watching those mechanisms over, over generations, it was merely the same old, same old happening again, more visibly and visible to a new population. Again, thank you. That, that's amazing. Uh, Dan, what do you think? I have really nothing uh, worth adding to any of this. That doesn't mean I won't add something. It just won't be as eloquent or uh, you know, as, uh, as persuasive. I think that the only thing I would add is that science fiction or speculative fiction more broadly could have been useful to a lot of people insofar as uh, in a fair amount of speculative fiction, or at least some speculative fiction, uh, there are authors and writers who have uh, imagined and presented futures of the United States that look in some ways similar to this one, not in the particulars, but in the sense of Americans uh, turning much more reactionary or Americans being will how Americans would behave under fascist rule, for example. Uh, and that could have, I think, conditioned some people who believed that certain kinds of political norms were so entrenched that they were impossible to move. It might have conditioned, helped them to um, see or understand uh, how there is really no special sauce in the United States uh, that makes uh, the United States uh, uh, body politic you know, immune from a certain form of demagoguery that we've tended to associate with Europe and other places, but in fact has been happening here for a very long time. That's incredible. Thank you. And that was very valuable. I really appreciate that. Um, so round two of the questions, and I have specific questions for each of you. Walida, you have edited an anthology about Octavia Butler, a Black woman who was a giant among science fiction authors. You also are a scholar of race relations. In her book, Parable of the Talents, Butler has a character, Andrew Steele Jarrett, an authoritarian style presidential candidate who wants to, quote, make America great again. How do you think Butler's works in general resonate today? Yeah, thank you. And I mean, you know, when Dan was saying again, what I think was very useful and eloquent, uh, you know, I think Octavia is one of those folks that um, if people were reading her, we would, and believing her and making decisions based on that analysis and understanding, we wouldn't be where we are today. I mean, you know, Octavia E. Butler's work, it, you know, it's a it, uh, parable of the sower just hit the New York Times bestseller list for the first time 14 years after Octavia's death. There's a reason for that. It's because her work as a whole, and I think Parable of the Sower specifically, is incredibly prophetic for this moment. It's prophetic not because, uh, you know, she had some tie to the future or she, you know, saw this in a crystal ball. It's because she engaged in immense amounts of study and research and reflection, just like we've all talked about, that she studied history, she studied patterns, and she looked at where America was when she was writing this and said, if this continues unabated, this is where we will be. And we are very much uh, where Octavia said we would be um, on, on many fronts. And so, you know, I think that it shows us the power of science fiction, not as an escapist route, not as something that exists 
in some other world, but as a sort of predictive method for us to understand what will happen if we don't make change. And specifically for me and my work, which is tying science fiction to social change, our power and our capacity to change everything. I think the last piece about Octavia's work that is incredibly useful to us in this moment is most of her works are written in futures uh, or other worlds that are worse than where we are right now. And I think it allows us to understand that the possibility for transformative change always exists. I think that we often lose hope if things are getting worse and we think, well, we lost it, it was getting better, now it's getting worse, there's nothing to be done. I think Octavia's work reminds us that change, liberation, revolution, transformation are always possible. And even as things get worse, we have the right and we have the responsibility to imagine new just futures and to do the work to make them lived reality. Do you think though that it also is a warning to us not to be too um, complacent when things seem to be going well, to always remember that things could get worse? Absolutely. I mean, I think it's important to recognize that, you know, and again, this is part of Octavia's historical study, is to look, I think any futurist needs to be rooting in the past. I don't think that we can imagine that the future is being built out of, you know, cotton candy and, and rainbows, right? It is, it is being built out of the tools that we have today. And to understand the future, we need to understand the past. And the, the cyclical nature of change, you know, I think one of the, the lies that science fiction has, has given us is a colonial lie that uh, progress is a straight linear line. This is a this is the way colonialism justifies itself, right? You move from savagery towards greatness, and therefore any atrocity committed is justified. The reality is is that history shows us at best changes a spiral. We can look down and say we have been here before. Let us do something different so we keep moving upwards. And so I think again, any futurist needs to be rooting in an understanding of the, of the future that is nonlinear, that is transformative, and that learns from and is in communion with the past. That's amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Dan, question for you. When you see a president like Donald Trump, who has been so extraordinary on so many levels, including just shattering norms, what sort of science fiction characters come to mind for you? And is there a parallel for a Joe Biden or a moment like we're about to have with this upcoming election? So unfortunately, the science fiction that I spend the most time on uh, tends to be a uh, not the right science fiction to answer that question, but I think we've already gotten a really good example of a work that could have um, provided, uh, you know, that could have been helpful. I think that um, there is a branch of speculative fiction, which is often coded as literature rather than science fiction. And I'm thinking about um, the work of Margaret Atwood or It Can't Happen Here uh, or The Plot Against America, which is essentially science fiction as we would understand it, all of which has imagined um, what the United States would be like under uh, either a similar president or an explicitly fascist regime. And I think all of that uh, is helpful, but it's helpful only insofar as, again, it sort of demonstrates to us how Americans would adapt, welcome, operate under such a system. Right or operate under such a president. Um, there is actually, I think that that most science fiction that I spend time on is much uh, where it can really help us is not so much about individual agents, right, individual people, but the this attention to careful world building can help us think about sort of structural environments and contexts in a way that I think is probably cuts more against the idea of Trump as uh, exceptional or individual or having particular kinds of uh, characteristics that we would focus on and in, in more in the way that we've been talking about is understanding uh, a broader set of social contextual factors uh, and how they might uh, relate to the present. I, before we go to the next question, I mean, one of the things I have been thinking about a lot lately is how so much of the system that we have in the United States um, has you know, evolved to the point where it relies so much on the personality of a single person or the actions of a single person. And, you know, the president is one example, but also, for instance, 
Ruth Bader Ginsburg was another example. People feel now like, oh man, you know, like so much of what we were building and hoping would stay uh, on a number of rights issues, that sort of thing, seem to just rely on, you know, one tiny 80 um, something year old woman. And so it's interesting you're saying it, it's, it can be more about world building and institutions, but it seems like today it's, it's as much about uh, in some ways, it can be just about like one person and whether that's a good idea or not. I, uh, it's not really my place to say, I guess. Um, so next question, John, uh, you have worked on a number of well-known movie scripts, including Prometheus, Doctor Strange, and of course, Dune. Dune is a particular favorite of people who encouraged me to pull together this event. I have been given so many questions to ask you about Dune, but let's start with this one. What is it about the Dune universe that could feel relevant to where the world as a whole is right now? Dune is a fascinating and fraught book. There's a lot happening in it. Um, fundamentally, it was written in its time as a kind of parable about uh, imperialism and resource extraction and the inevitable oppressive mechanic of a world built on that principle. Um, and it was, you know, soundly focused on oil as a notion. And it brings up with it a lot of things that are more situational to that specific thing. So not just the abstraction of resource extraction, but specifically the oppression of the Arab world, the uh, technological imbalance between the invaders and the aboriginal inhabitants of that world. Um, what's amazing to that about that for a present day viewer is that that was 50, 60 years ago. And that dynamic is still absolutely at play in our world. We might be beginning to see the tipping of the balance away from oil extraction and toward a future of lithium extraction and cobalt extraction, but we are still seeing that essential imperialistic mechanic at play. Um, so it's an amazing thing that a book so very much of its moment of the oil shock um, is so timeless as to be absolutely relevant to what is happening today. Uh, the book also delves deeply into the notion of patriarchy as a ruling schema and it balances against that an essentially mystical cult of matriarchal women who represent the most subtle and long viewed power in that civilization. Um, and you know, the book commits a couple of sins in that domain as well. It is kind of a white savior tale, but it deeply respects um, the kind of crypto Arab civilization it posits on Iraq as it deeply respects the women who are disempowered under that regime of patriarchy and yet whose long view may remain the most dominant force in the universe going forward. I think all of those things feel ripped from the headlines today. You know, I'm really glad you, because you actually segued into a couple of the audience questions that I was given ahead uh, of this event. Uh, and, you know, one of them actually was, it was for you, John. It said, um, you know, how did you incorporate Islamic and Middle East North Africa themes from the book into your script? Uh, and how, uh, you know, did you approach, for instance, uh, uh, MENA and Muslim actors for advice on how to put it together? Uh, Arab and Middle Eastern actors. Um, did you take those people's advice into account? There were conversations, they're more reading than talking. Um, the biggest thing that rings funny to the modern ear is just about the size of the world. Meaning that when Frank Herbert wrote his original text, um, he did a lot of reading about the Arab world and was obviously fascinated. The book is filled with loan words and borrowed traditions and a kind of extrapolation of a proto-Arab civilization into the far future. Um, but the fact is that to a typical American, the Arab world was much more exotic in the 1960s than it is today. You know, today the Arab world is with us. There are fellow Americans, they're everywhere. Um, they are players in a world stage and a much more liquid so a global society, a world in which there's much more social interchange. So if you were to build a kind of Arab future on an Arrakis in a novel starting today, you would need to invent more and borrow less. Um, essentially to expropriate intact fewer things and rather extrapolate more into the future and envision that society evolving and changing. What you can really see is that to Frank Herbert's worldview, um, just dipping into Islam and dipping into the Arab world was sufficiently exotic to be science fiction. And now for us, Islam and the Arab world are neighbors and friends and among us, they're us. And so you'd have to go farther afield to make science fiction of it. That is fascinating. Dan, you have 
assigned Dune in your classes, right? To to your students to read. Um, mm -hmm. Why do you think it's a good good choice? Like, what what is it that drives you to to include that particular book in your curriculum? Well, the big reason I think John's already alluded to. There's so much going on in it that it's a good text for a seminar with students because often you know, you have certain ideas about what you might want to talk about, but you also want them to be able to generate their own arguments, their own ideas out of the text. And Dune is really good for that. Um, everything from both the sort of positives from a modern perspective of the gender politics, but also the way in which there's a lot of gender essentialism, for example. And so I like texts that um, allow students to talk about a lot of contemporary issues in a science fiction setting, uh, but allow them to go in their own direction. So that's the main reason. But I will say that there are two things in Dune that really interest me. Uh, one is that uh, there's a, a large body of scholarship that deals with the problem of the ways in which messianic authority has to rely on traditional uh, texts, right? It has to both simultaneously break from that tradition because it is offering a new way of religiously envisioning the world, but also ultimately has authority that is derived from the tradition that it is supposed to be reinventing, right? And this is goes back to say Max Weber's work on different forms of authority. And I think Dune is an amazing job of capturing uh, the way the, the kinds of dilemmas that creates for somebody in a messianic position, uh, somebody in this case who uh, is both using that tradition instrumentally to um, retake his what he believed, you know, his to retake his planet and his position and perhaps bring down an empire, uh, but is also constrained by that in ways that he is deeply morally ambivalent or in fact despondent about. And for me, that's a really interesting, rich thing to talk about in a class. There's other reasons, but I, I won't take more time. Than that. Well, well, Lita, I, I was interested. I, I want to bring you in on this because um, now, remind me, I don't know if you consider yourself an Afrofuturist or if you study Afrofuturism, but I was curious as to how you see Afrofuturism. And this is, please even, I don't even want to misdefine it, but my understanding is like it's this envisionment of Africa in a very futuristic way and how that's being uh, incorporated into our storytelling more and more. Uh, you know, I've been told Black Panther was an example of Afrofuturistic uh, writing. I was curious if you, where you see that going in science fiction and um, how you hope it will go. Like, what are some things you would not want to see uh, down the road? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, uh, Afrofuturism is, is a very broad term. And so, you know, we don't have to make this an Afrofuturist panel. Um, you know, I, you know, I call myself a Black futurist. Um, the term that I started using, visionary fiction, specifically looks at fantastical art that can help us imagine new just worlds. So it's very much intimately tied together with social justice movements, with organizing. Um, and, you know, to me, I think, you know, there's there's been a lot of debate around uh, terms. And I think terms are only useful if they help advance the conversation. I think if not, then I don't want to argue about terms. I want to talk about the principles and the ideas behind them. You know, one of the things that I do think is important is to recognize that what, even though when we put a new label on something, it doesn't mean it's new, right? And I, you know, was just thinking about um, Octavia E. Butler in Parable of the uh, Parable of the Trickster, actually, which was the unpublished. Uh, third book in the parable series, one of the, the verses she wrote said, there's, there's nothing new under the sun, but there are new suns. And I love that idea, right? Because I think it, it really encapsulates this notion that um, many of the conversations we have are not new, and yet they are happening in new ways because of different conditions. So to me, I think it's important to recognize Black folks have always been engaged and oppressed peoples in general have always been engaged in being part of, of futurism. You know, I think Black folks are the progenitors of futurism. You can root in, you know, ancient African civilizations that gave us things that at the time were science fiction and understanding of the stars, being able to tell where you are based on that is science fiction until someone made that our lived reality. That to me is, is visionary fiction. It's what's useful about saying, how do we imagine the impossible and then change the entire world to make it our lived reality. And I think that black folks have been doing that 
again and again and again. And so to me, it's not just about envisioning Blackness into the future, but it's about saying, how do we recognize Blackness as a sort of subversive, time-traveling, uh, transformative uh, place to locate for ourselves and a place to re-envision everything we know about the past, the present, and the future. You're muted. Sorry, uh, thank you. Uh, we have a couple of questions from the audience. And again, if you're watching right now, please uh, put the messages in Facebook and they'll get me the questions to ask. This is, a, this is actually a very good one. Um, and John, why don't we start with you? And the, the writer says, sorry to go basic, but how, but can you define science fiction? Philip Roth's plot against America and Margaret Atwood's Handmaiden's Tale are said to be science fiction, but not like say Ray Bradbury. So how do you define it, John? That's a good question. And it's going to be a statistical cloud at the end of the day, but fundamentally, I think science fiction is a, a school of fiction that attempts to root uh, an unreal universe, an unrecognizable universe is an evolution of the world we live in. So not a lateral departure into a mystical or a fantastic world, a fairy tale, but to start with some truth in our world, that's the science and the fiction, and extrapolate through that uh, toward a world that we find strange. And that can be a day after tomorrow change that looks at narrowly at a specific shift. You know, what if we really could dock computers to the brain. What if you could save your memories as a jar, as a captive consciousness? What if you could unlock genetic memory and then look at that? And it can also be a explosive, metastatic, chaotic look at a world in which 20 things have galloped forward down the paths they seem to be on and looking at all of those things. But fundamentally it's an extrapolation into strangeness from the familiar. Dan. I want to follow up on that. Um, you, you, when John was talking about it, it seemed, sounded to me like it was about evolution. But is it still science fiction if it's about like going backward? Like if we woke up tomorrow and all of our power sources had disappeared and we had to start from scratch, um, you know, is that also science fiction? And I think you're on mute. You okay? Good technical situation, I think. Oh, are you okay? Or Dan, you're on mute. <laughs> landing a plane i think <laughs> i think he's saying maybe move on and come back to him okay, okay. all right That's hi good. can you hear me because my audio my audio cut out You've and i it. need to restore it so i don't know what you asked and maybe somebody else should answer it um let me i, I can hear you now can you hear me awesome. okay. we're having some tech issues walita do you want to answer that uh this idea of like you know this is going backward also science fiction uh, I mean, yeah, I think, <laughs> you know, as John said, I mean, it's a big, that's a big question. And there have been, you know, many Comic-Con panels that have been completely derailed by arguing if something is, has enough scientific, you know, fantastical, what, you know, is this science fiction? Is it magical realism? Is it fantasy? I mean, that's honestly part of why I started using the term visionary fiction to be a bucket, because I'm like, what is interesting to me is, you know, what John said about uh, the finding the the strain, the the play of the strange and the familiar that allows us to imagine beyond what we're told is realistic and possible. And so, for me, that's why I started saying visionary fiction because I was less interested if it was technically fantasy or alternative timeline or horror, and more about the abilities and the spaces it allows us to. Um, imagine and engage with our world differently. I, I think that piece is really important, right? And I think a lot of times science fiction gets created as something, again, that is escapist. It is completely separate from this world. But I think what we've all been saying and really powerfully is that science fiction is built of this world and it is useful in what it helps us to teach about what this world is, what it was and what it could be. I get it on this for a second. Yeah. yeah. Can you hear me? Um, so yeah, the um the the term that's often bandied about in science fiction studies for some of what we're talking about is the idea that speculative fiction, science fiction introduces a novum, right? Something that is new, that is different, 
that creates a counterfactual, right? That is, it creates an alternative, whether it be in the future or the past or the present, an alternative uh, set of all things are not the way that they are. And this can be very subtle or it can be quite extreme. Um, and one of the main benefits that's supposed to accrue from that is the idea that it produces cognitive estrangement, that people are separated in some way from what they are reading or consuming. Uh, and for political scientists, both of these are extremely useful because a lot of what we do hinges upon thinking through counterfactual scenarios. We want to understand like what caused World War I or what caused World War II, for example. And a lot of what we do then from a kind of uh, more politically theoretic normative perspective, it can be useful to have students who are displaced, who don't necessarily uh, read something and always see their own ideological priors in the situation. Although when this is done poorly, it's done extremely poorly. That being said, uh, all fiction, theoretically, because it's fictional, also introduces uh, kind of a counterfactual element, right? Uh, people who don't exist. Uh, and so I actually tend to favor the idea that that genres are defined by genre expectations, but what we think comes with them. Uh, and so science fiction is a sense, uh, whatever shows up in the science fiction section of a bookstore. Um, and uh, if we kind of get too, too hung up on whether or not the science has to be real by the standards of its time or whether you can have hyperdrive and fast and light travel, uh, I think that kind of takes us away from the more interesting uses of science fiction. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you guys are like so much smarter than me. Like, and, and here's the thing. The, the audience is also sending in these incredible questions. And so, John, I'm going to give you this one. Um, and so I, I'm hoping you can walk us through it. Um, the writer says, I'm curious about the normative aspects of world building. For example, Herbert includes eugenics as an aspect of how the world in Dune works without much criticism of the idea in the plots of the Dune novels. How do you think about engaging with authors potential ideological messaging versus building dystopian or pro problematic worlds? Mm, that's a great pick. Um, one of the interesting things about Dune is that it is very knowing about some of the kinds of dubious morality which it peddles, meaning that uh, it is aware of the patriarchy of its world and it talks about that. And there's a dialogue in the book about the, the moral dubiousness of the foundations and shape of that society. It's aware of its colonialism um, and largely takes the part of the oppressed and sort of the switching of the protagonist from one side to the other is part of the text of the story. But it also engages deeply in a notion that uh, people of breeding are of more important breeding and that who your parents are is the determinant of your destiny and that eugenics works, uh, which I think is a deeply poisonous notion, um, but it's essentially intrinsic to the mythology of the story like in adapting the film. It was not a moving part. It is essential to the plot and resolution of the book. Um, and so the question then becomes, how do you find a way to insert respectfully a little modern conversation about that idea into the text of the story? Uh, for me, the moral calculus of any story I'm writing or adapting is always a frontline matter. Um, as I invent, I, I struggle with superhero stories because I think they debase ordinary people. And so I'm still interested in superhero stories and Lord knows our, our society has gotten its teeth into them in recent decades. But for me, it's always important to make it very plain as a minor subversion, even in a superhero story, that ordinary people matter and matter as much. Um, so the moral calculus for me is always a, a live wire and it's the thing that keeps me awake at night. Um, what are the ramifications of the story that we're telling? Uh, do you, I guess I'm just gonna throw this one out there and any, any of you can, can grab it. Um, does Frank Herbert's portrayal of Paul as a kind of flawed messiah serve as a cautionary tale about an alluring desire for quick solutions and saviors in our own day? Uh, one of the lessons of Dune is that there are no heroes, the world is not Manichaean, and that those resisting oppression can also be deeply imperfect. Uh, we also had another person ask about this idea of the, the white savior idea and whether and how, how that factors into all of this. Um, Dan, Walida, John, who wants to go first on that one? I, I mean, I, I feel like I will 
I can talk about those issues. I don't think I, given the, the expertise of folks specifically around Dune, I don't feel like that's uh, necessarily my place for that. But, you know, I do think that that decent, the white savior is really important. And I think, you know, uh, I really, you know, appreciated what Dan said about, you know, kind of the genre expectations. I, don't, I believe genres are, you know, created by capitalism to turn art into commodities, right? And it doesn't in any way truly reflect uh, the ways that the art is created or the ways that the art is engaged with. And uh, it often ends up um, being utilized for both monetary and, um, you know, and so met methods of social control as well. I mean, I think there's a reason that science fiction and fantastical writing has been, you know, maligned and marginalized in this way of escapism of calling it that again and again, because it's about if we were to recognize that this is something we could take back with us to this world over and over again, then we could question everything. And I think that is the power of fantastical writing. And I think for you know, systems of oppression to maintain themselves, that's the danger of fantastical writing. That's why it is so, you know, we, we think of it as like, that's something you do for fun and it has nothing to do with this world. Because if we can, accept, you know, uh, blue aliens or, you know, um, talking, you know, uh, tardigrades, then we can accept any change in this world itself. And so, you know, but I think fundamental to sort of the ways that um, science fiction has been used as a method of social control is the, the centering of the white savior. And I think, you know, again, that's not unique to science fiction. That's the way that uh, these genres have been recruited to maintain uh, the existence of this space. I mean, there's there's a reason there is so much, you know, connection and, and parallels between Westerns and the way mainstream science fiction is written, because they have both been used to further, uh, you know, a colonial imperialist white supremacist notion of expansion, one in in the Americas and one in space. But the, you know, the notion of you know, uh, the original Star Trek was sold as a wagon train to the stars. This idea of exploring new worlds to colonize it with a, you know, Eurocentric uh, white frame, which, you know, as much as Star Trek brought us other things, it did not decenter whiteness at all in, in the original. And so, you know, I think it's, it's important to recognize that that is not necessarily part of what science fiction can be. It's been part of what has been built into science fiction to serve existing power structures. And we can change that. And so my work very much centers the voices of the oppressed. It's not about the privileged waking up one morning and finding out privilege is existing. I think that those are important stories, but I think we have a lot of those stories. I think what we don't have enough of is stories that root in the oppressed, the marginalized, the enslaved, and shows how together from the bottom up, people organize to get free, which is a historical certainty as well as a futuristic exploration. To, to follow up on that same thing with you, actually, we do have a question that says, with every passing year, more diverse authors appear in science fiction anthologies and win science fiction awards. How have the stories changed with the inclusion of more diverse authors? And I'd love Walida if you could talk, but I'd also love to get Dan's comments on that. But Walida, let's we'll start with you. Okay. Um, I mean, I think again, for me, uh, it's, this is about who is centered and for me, I center, you know, um, oppressed voices. I, I center voices that sit at the intersections of oppression and identity. I don't want to just be added to a, a white norm. I want to decenter and destabilize that white norm. And so, I'm incredibly excited about the uh, the movement of brilliant writers, especially writers of color, into these more traditional science fiction spaces. But I think it's incredibly important to recognize that we have always created our own spaces of imagination, um, of play, and that that has been inherent in the ways that we tell stories, whether or not 
mainstream white science fiction has acknowledged or supported or recognized that. Um, and you, I mean, W.V. Du Bois wrote science fiction and fantasy stories, and they were not, you know, white people, white science fiction writers were like, oh, this is science fiction, this is amazing. But that use of the fantastical was key to his way of exploring racial identity, race relations, and racial formation. So this is not new to us. And while I'm excited that mainstream white science fiction is now recognizing the wealth of brilliance and the ways that those perspectives shift uh, the story itself, it's important that for me to not center in those spaces, but instead to center in the spaces, the imaginings, the visioning that we have been engaged in for decades, for centuries, for millennia. Thank you, thank you. Dan, um, if you're technically uh, able to hear us, like, do you have any thoughts on that issue? You've, you've, like, you've studied science fiction for so long. I mean, have you noticed this uh, increasing diversity of voices and how do you think that has affected the, the genre? So I, I should be very clear here. I am not in science fiction studies. Uh, I am not somebody who professionally studies science fiction. I'm primarily a consumer, but I like to teach through science fiction. Uh, and that's, you know, I've done a little, I'm in a field of international relations where there are, there is now a subset of work that looks at literature. Uh, I've contributed a little bit to that field, but I, I have no comprehensive knowledge of <laughs> the genre, right? So anything you hear from me is, is repeated from histories I've read written by other people, for example. Um, but that being said, science fiction has always been ideologically suffused, right? Um, uh, whether we talk about uh, uh, the mainstream, which in the United States for a very long time was very heavily gate kept, for example, or whether we think about other national traditions of science fiction, like the, like the Soviet tradition of science fiction, uh, or whether we think about uh, uh, certain, or whether we think about uh, going back to the 19th century, where um, if 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 the colonial aspects of modern science fiction can sometimes be subtle, it is not, <laughs> right? In the science romances that develop in the 19th and early 20th century, that many people root as one of the the bases of the, at least the Anglophone version of the genre or the Western European version of the genre. So it's always been ideologically suffused. Um, and to me, it's always interesting and richer when you have more perspectives uh, and more subject positions uh, and more different kinds of stories to tell. Um, and this is the difference between treating science fiction as sort of comfort food, right, where you can go and you can hear the same stories over and over again. And there's something to that. I like to relax, too. But I like my science fiction to challenge me and, to, and I think to get more diversity of voices in science fiction they've always been there, uh, but to, to be recognized by the mainstream, in other words, to come to my attention as a non-scholar, means that I have more interesting stories to read and I have more uh, rich things to think about uh, than I might have had, you know, 15 or 20 years ago. Thank you. All right, so going back to round three of questions from me, uh, John, mm -hmm. you are pretty open on Twitter about your political views. Uh, you seem to often be critical of the president. Uh, how does this political moment affect your writing? Um, and how do you see your corner of the entertainment world responding to it? Well, what's interesting is that I think the entertainment world, the world of storytellers writ large, and society itself are both grappling with something that's happening now that to me feels schismatic, really, with the train of history. I feel that we've seen... Um, society shocks in the past um, as the information velocity of our society has ramped up at certain times. You had Marshall McLuhan warning us about the increasing speed of information. Um, their cyberpunk was born as information on the internet began to propagate and new kinds of dramas became possible and uh, different ways of human interaction that uh, were separate from the body, purely cerebral, mediated by electronic systems, fascinated a whole generation of science fiction writers. What we're seeing right now is a crisis of societal bandwidth. Um, we are seeing that our civilization, the fabric of our society has a limited ability to handle a certain number of emergencies and that a propagation of emergencies across a sufficiently not large number of fronts breaks the system down. 
We see that in norm violation. We see that in the parallel crises, in the breakdown of our democracy, in the ecological crisis, in the breakdown of uh, global alliances and cooperation among countries, in uh, the pandemic sweeping the world. There is a system shock happening because of the number of crises. You realize there is a civilizational bandwidth that certain things can only be addressed um, when a whole society can focus on them. I think the reason we're seeing this simultaneity of crises goes all the way back to the beginning uh, of our panel here. We talked a little bit about um, strongman leadership, uh, about the narrowing, the, the centering of power in a single leader. Um, in a functioning democracy with multiple departments, ideally you have decentralized expertise. And when these crises show up on multiple fronts, bureaucracies of educated people address them on multiple fronts simultaneously, that when you consolidate power at a single point, as in a fascist regime, as in a dictatorship, then the information response bandwidth of the society becomes the information response bandwidth of that person and the people in the room. And what we're seeing right now is that we've bottlenecked America's governmental response capacity in a single room, and we are facing more crises than that room can respond to. And as a consequence, we as a society are crashing. I think we're only going to see more and more of this multifarious crisis as we move forward. Um, we're seeing population pressure, ecological pressure, new political crises, and it is a new kind of information overload. Um, and to a certain extent, it tests our notion of what a government is and can be, how, how centralized or decentralized it should be. I expect that after a suitable metabolic period for everyone thinking about it, we're going to see new fiction about this kind of crisis shock. And by new fiction, like you're talking about whether it's in a book form or a movie form or screenwriting or whatever. I mean, we're a variety of different types of telling. That's right. We're going to see storytellers tackling uh, the kind of crisis we're seeing our country stumble into now, which feels like a crisis that is new in kind in some fundamental way. Honestly, your answer is absolutely terrifying, but, but thank you. <laughs> um, Dan, uh, putting aside Trump and thinking about foreign policy more directly, one of your specialties, it does seem as if the world is entering a new phase of great power competition. And this time it's China versus the US with Russia trying to have a say too. What are some themes in sci-fi that can help foreign policy geeks among us understand which way this could all go? So I'm gonna challenge the question for a second because um, I have a piece percolating uh, with uh, Ali Wine uh, about this. Uh, I don't think we're entering an era of great power competition. I think that there is more great power competition, but I am more concerned, I'm in some ways less concerned about, about that uh, than I am about the idea that's percolating in policymaking circles that somehow we've entered a world with a new structure, a new organizing principle uh, in which uh, essentially there, it is a world of great power competition, therefore we must compete without answering the question over what and to what extent, right? So I'm actually very concerned about the ways in which great power competition can become a self-fulfilling prophecy and in which it serves certain kinds of interests uh, in the United States. For example, an interest to, um, it, it's very caught up, I think, even though people don't necessarily always realize it, it's very caught up in a critique of uh, liberal internationalist foreign policy um, that argues in essence that we've been naive and misled for 35 years and we need to get back to hard brass power politics, um, even though it's always, always sort of been power politics and these things aren't oppositional. That being said, science fiction is extremely dangerous here. Um, and the reason is that uh, when, sci when, when science fiction authors world build, like everybody else, um, they draw upon either implicitly or explicitly uh, theories that they are aware of about how the world works, right? So they, they draw on folk theories about international politics, or they draw on something they've read, right? They draw on theories of the balance of power, right? Or theories of hegemonic stability, or theories of the way empire works. And that can be wonderfully exciting to read and to think through. But the fact of the matter is that it also tends to make those theories seem more plausible than they necessarily are. Right. Uh, Uta Weldis is one of the people who pioneered the study of science fiction, or at least the last round, most recent round, Michael Shapiro before her, a bunch of other people, but pointed out that one of the dangers uh, of reading uh, work of science fiction and being able to say, aha, I see that that is this particular political dynamic in play. 
is that it makes that political dynamic seem like the way things really are, right? If this is a little bit obscure, let me give you an example. So a lot of people play um, competitive strategy games like Civilization, right? I mean, I, you know, and those games, for reasons of balance and challenge, have algorithms built into them that are designed to say, as you get more powerful, as the player gets more powerful, states are more, the other actors are more likely to align against them, right? And are more likely to challenge them. That's a balance of power dynamic. Um, does the balance of power always operate? Does it always operate that way? I don't know. We're debating it in my field. Um, and so I worry a lot that you sort of unproblematically bring in ideas about the way international politics work. And when you read them in science fiction, uh, you see them as more natural than they actually are. Um, I could name check a bunch of other work. Uh, uh, J. Daniel Furman and Paul Musgrave have a really cool piece about the way in which Tom Clancy uh, in the Hunt for Red October wound up influencing Reagan policy. Uh, you know, it's treated as if it were factual rather than fiction. Uh, in discussions. And so there are kind of some dangers here. I think we have to be very wary. That is really interesting. I'm definitely going to look forward to reading that piece you and Ali are writing. Lolita, uh, this actually sort of sort of along the same lines, but what do you think is a, is a common mistake that science fiction writers make when they try to predict the future? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I think the two biggest mistakes are one thinking that technological changes mean that there will be fundamental changes to uh, the way that that power functions in society. I think, you know, obviously technology changes us immensely. And as John was talking about the speed of information, um, the ways that things function. But I think oftentimes when we're talking about, you know, how do we solve social issues? How do we solve things that have been built into the fabric of the way our society is structured? Folks offer technological options. And we've seen again and again that that doesn't fundamentally change how power happens, right? The, the amount of information, the fact that we all have more access to, uh, you know, computing power than, <clears throat> than, you know, uh, than the Voyager, um, you know, space probe, uh, every single day has not fundamentally changed the fact that, you know, there is widespread economic, social, political inequality that exists nationally and internationally. So we can't be looking to technological advances to fundamentally solve uh, issues that have been built into the foundations and the fabric of this society. I think the, you know, the other thing that is the biggest mistake that, um, science fiction writers make, I don't actually think is a mistake. I think it's a commitment to a specific worldview that I actually don't subscribe to and think is a mistake. And that is sort of the continuation of, of the norm. The idea that what is happening now, what has happened before will, will continue to happen in the future. That we can make small changes, but fundamentally we cannot reimagine or restructure society or the way we engage with with one another which i think you know other folks on this panel have been talking about and i think that you know that uh is about maintaining current systems of power and what it does is it takes away the uh, the ability to see these possibilities as uh, real potential futures. So right now, folks are in the streets across this nation, uh, you know, using the, the framing of defund the police, abolish the police. The idea that we could not imagine a future without police and that that is ridiculous and that therefore the only thing that can be done is, you know, to tinker with it and to create reform is a lack of imagination that supports the existing status quo. And so I, I fundamentally think that um, those of us who, who are creating these futures have to take responsibility for the futures that we are creating. And if our goal is to help perpetuate this existing structure, then we should say that and we should be clear and honest about that. Because I'm clear and honest, my goal with the futures that I create is to radically transform this entire system and this entire structure. It is to create spaces so we can collectively imagine what we've been told is impossible, which is true freedom and liberation. So we only have a couple minutes left and I just wanted to ask one last question of all three of you, which is what is your recommended book suggestion, science fiction, 
uh, of a book that you feel doesn't get enough attention, that's not very well known. And if it's not, it's a different book, it doesn't have to be sci-fi, but basically I just want our listeners to get some new book ideas. So why don't we start with John? Uh, in science fiction, I would say the book I would most want people to read uh, that they probably, if they're not a certain sort of nerd, haven't heard of is Stanislav Lem's Siberiad, uh, written in 1965, which I think is one of the most audaciously visionary um, pieces of science fiction writing, immensely influential uh, within bookish sci-fi writers, not very well known to the American public, certainly. Um, and you know, one of those books that, like some of early Asimov, is willing to like make massive leaps away uh, from the world we know. Talk about not building on priors and assuming society will retain its shape. Um, Stanislav Levin had an extraordinarily flexible mind. Um, and uh, he was a Polish writer uh, in sort of the Russian school of sci-fi. And uh, just, I can't think of anything that is as audacious or more audacious, certainly, imaginatively than that. Si Siberiad, okay. Siberiad. Oh, you remember that. Uh, Dan, what's your suggestion? You're on mute. <laughs> I think after a year of Zoom, we would, you know, not make these mistakes anymore. Uh, so I, I like agonized over this question because there's all these different things I could name and in and, and whatever. But so I'm going to make a kind of weird, what might strike some as a sort of odd choice, which is I'm going to name a fairly recent book about about ten plus years old um, by Charlie Strauss called Halting State. Uh, and the reason I'm going to recommend that is actually what John was talking about. Is I think it's the book I've read so far in the science fiction realm. Uh, that has dealt most effectively with the problem of how you conduct politics and agency in an era in which you cannot attribute the information that you're getting or the directives you're getting, right? When you do not know whether your zombie flash mob is a bit of good fun or it's somebody using that zombie flash mob to uh, interdict uh, a police activity, for example. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that's actually one of the really fundamental problems of contemporary politics is not knowing who and what interests are behind the information that you are propagating um, or that may be you know, causing you to behave in certain ways. So. Halton State? Mm -hmm. Excellent. Lolita, bring it home. What's your recommended book? Well, I, I have a similar feeling to Dan that I always am like, oh, I'm going to forget everything important. And then I also feel like, oh, I've never read a book before in my life. And then the minute anyone asked me for a book recommendation. So even though you asked this ahead of time, I still feel that way. I mean, I, you know, I think I, I you know, I root, I think rooting in, in Octavia E. Butler in this moment is, um, is so useful. And obviously she's on the bestseller list, so she's not uh, unknown. But I think, you know, I think folks look to her book, Parable of the Sower, Parable of the Talents, which is set in the, you know, the 2020s in, which was then the future in America. It feels very relevant to our current situation. Um, but I think her other works that, uh, you know, deal with aliens, if we're talking about Lilith's Brood, or deal with vampires, if we're talking about fledgling, or deal with um, tele, you know, telepathic mutants, if we're looking at uh, Wild Seed and the Pattern Master series. I think all of those have incredibly important lessons. So, you know, even though people are reading Octavia, I hope that they don't just stop at Parable of the Sower and Parable of the Talents, because I think those other books that may feel a little more removed from this moment offer us that, that space, that break that Dan and John were talking about, that uh, science fiction does so well that can really allow us to reflect entirely on uh, not just this current moment, but the systems that we want to build. I think the you know the important thing for me is looking at someone like Octavia E. Butler. The world building that she does is the is really the same process of world building we need in organizing in change making. 
because we need to stop saying what reforms can we win and start with the question, what is the world that we want? How do we imagine it not as these broken apart pieces of this is what we want for healthcare, this is what we want for education. How do we say this is the world we want? This is the vision we want. And from there, that means in these different areas, this is what needs to manifest. And I think Octavia's work can help us to build and to practice and to flex that world building muscle that we absolutely vitally need anytime, but certainly in these times. Well, you guys, this has just surpassed my expectations. Like I, I, I really like I'm on the verge of tears. I am. I have learned so much. You, you're all amazing. Your answers were so enlightening, a little scary sometimes, I'm not gonna lie, um, and just absolutely fascinating. And I'm so grateful that you took the time to join us. Uh, I wanna also thank Mahdis for handling so many of the logistics of this. Um, you know, maybe I can, maybe we can do more of this sort of thing in the future. I think there's so many discussions to be had and I know we covered a lot of territory, but I'm so glad that you guys were there for the journey. Uh, thank you very, very much. Uh, and everybody, uh, please check out amija.org, A-M-E-J-A.org, if you're interested in our journalism organization. Uh, and thank you all for joining us. Thank you. And thank you forever. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you for having us. And it was great to meet everybody. Thank no, you. This was great. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Take care, guys. Thanks so much. Take care. Bye, everyone.